Wonderful. Hello, Dr. Lethaby. Hi. Wonderful. So I'm going to introduce you very briefly to the group, and then we'll just kick, get right into it, okay? Great. Thanks. Okay. So Dr. Chris Lethaby is a lecturer in philosophy at the University of Western Australia, and he's a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Adelaide. Thanks, everyone. Uh, I'm really glad to be invited and to be speaking at this conference. Of course, I really wish I could be there in person um, in Berlin, but it's quite cool to have the sort of hybrid um, conference thing as well and to be um, speaking to you, all of you in Berlin and around the world from the comfort of my living room with a, a cup of tea. So I'm going to start sharing my... Oh, actually, I just realised I don't know how to share my screen. Um, Okay, maybe this is it, present to audience. Maybe that's what I need to share my screen. Share screen, okay, sorry about this. Share screen, entire screen. But it's not letting me click. Sh oh, here we go, share. All right, so I'm just going to assume this is all working and... Um, you can still see me and my slides, uh, and hopefully someone will tell me somehow <laughs> if anything is going wrong. All right, so um, the talk I'm going to give is uh, called Psychedelics and Meditation, a Neurophilosophical Perspective, and it's a condensed version of a chapter that I've written that's going to be coming out next year in the Rutledge Handbook of the Philosophy of Meditation, edited by Rick Rapetti. And the basic topic is this idea that there is some kind of a connection between psychedelic ingestion and meditation practice. And um, this idea has been around in the zeitgeist, in particular in the Western imagination and discourse around these practices, at least since Aldous Huxley's Doors of Perception in the 1950s. And so the question I want to address is, first off, is there really a connection? And second, if there is, what is its nature? Is it deep or is it merely superficial? And I'm going to try and address this question, as I say, using a neurophilosophical method in a loose sense. So basically combining the conceptual, logical, argumentative tools of the discipline of philosophy with evidence drawn from the mind and brain sciences. And so using this method, I'm going to argue for the conclusion that the connection is real and deep. It's not merely superficial. And I'm going to offer a specific hypothesis about at least part of what the nature of the connection is. So the talk is in three parts. So in part one, I'm just going to outline this idea, the general idea of a connection between psychedelics and meditation and the history of this idea. Um, in part two, I'm going to turn to recent um, evidence, especially quantitative evidence from scientific studies. And then in section three, I'm going to outline my hypothesis about the nature of the connection and some implications that might follow from it. So section one, we're looking at the general idea of a connection. So I'm talking here about the ingestion of classic serotonergic psychedelics like LSD and psilocybin and the practice of mindfulness, also known as insight or vipassana meditation drawn from the Buddhist tradition. And if we look at both of these practices, we can immediately note a set of fairly surface level superficial parallels. And I think it was Dr. Catherine McLean in a conference presentation who originally brought my attention to these particular parallels. So we look at classic psychedelic ingestion and mindfulness meditation, and we see that both of them are ancient consciousness altering techniques with very long histories, um, centuries or millennia of use in non-Western cultures. And we can see that both of them came to widespread attention in Western society. You know, despite some sporadic earlier interest, both of them really came to widespread attention in the second half of the 20th century, starting around the 50s and 60s. Both of them now have been subjected to extensive scientific study, and both of them have been touted as secular psychotherapeutic interventions outside of their traditional religious and spiritual contexts of use. Interestingly, for overlapping sort of sets of 
uh, maladies such as um, anxiety, depression, addiction, substance use and mood disorders generally. And so I'm going to assume a basic familiarity with both of these practices. The original version of this talk has a brief overview of what classic psychedelics are and what mindfulness meditation is, but um, I needed to cut it down for reasons of time. So I'm just going to hope that everyone knows at least on a basic level what these two practices are. And so the question I want to address is, do the similarities go deeper than this intriguing and striking but fairly surface level list of parallels and the first reason to think that it might go deeper that there's some interesting connection comes from various early influential writers on thinkers and writers on both the psychedelic experience and meditation practice but in particular the early western thinkers who influenced the western conceptualization of the psychedelic experience in the 1950s and 60s tended to agree that there is some interesting connection between the types of states that psychedelics induce and the types of states that uh, Buddhist and Hindu meditation practices can induce. So in the Doors of Perception, Huxley suggested that psychedelics might offer temporary glimpses of the kinds of states that meditation aims to induce as permanent realizations. So state glimpses of the traits that meditation aims to induce. Um, Alan Watts, who was already devoted to the study and exposition of um, Eastern meditative practices echoed this claim in some of his work. And then, of course, Timothy Leary and co published a guide, a manual to the psychedelic experience that was specifically based on and adapted from the so-called Tibetan Book of the Dead. Um, and so the rest is history from this point on. The idea that there is some substantive or deep connection between these two practices was cemented in the popular Western and scientific imagination. Now, you might be a bit sceptical, right? On the basis of this potted history, you might note a couple of things. First off, that psychedelic experiences are notoriously highly variable, right? More variable than the effects of other psychoactive substances. They're strongly influenced in particular by the mindset of the person having the experience and the environment in which they have it. And you might note as well that Aldous Huxley and Alan Watts came to psychedelics fully loaded with a bunch of ideas about mysticism, the perennial philosophy, and so on. And so you might think basically, well, Insofar as people do take psychedelics like LSD and psilocybin and have experiences that resemble meditative experiences, perhaps this is only because they're expecting to, right? So perhaps Huxley and Watson Co. had these Satori type experiences on psychedelics because that was what they were chasing. And perhaps, uh, you know, other people since have tended to have these kinds of experiences because they've read Huxley, Watson, Leary, or because the ideas have been transmitted to them through various cultural channels. And so in a recent paper, the philosopher Miguel Sebastian presses this sort of objection and he notes based on a, a review of the anthropological literature that in at least some traditional contexts, psychedelic use, as he puts it, is all about meeting spirits and getting power and knowledge from them without reference to ego dissolution or mystical union. So on this basis, he presses the idea that uh, it's basically suggestion and expectation that's accounting for a lot of the meditative type experiences that people have when they take psychedelics. Now, my response to this objection is basically that cultural transmission and expectation of this kind might play a role, it might contribute somewhat, but can't really explain all the similarities that we see between psychedelic and meditative experiences. And my first ground for this claim comes from a closer look at the history of psychedelic research. So I just gave you this potted history where psychedelic experience got popularized by people who were already devotees of mysticism, of Buddhist and Hindu meditation and so on. But actually, if we look more closely, we find that, of course, there were earlier Western scientific investigations of psychedelics prior to the sort of mysticism inflected investigations of Huxley, Watson, Leary that talked about things like depersonalization and changes to ego boundaries. So back in the 1930s, you have um, investigators talking about the effects of mescaline in these terms, changes to the sense of self and depersonalization and so on. Similar point, if you look at the early scientific reports on LSD, some of these were roughly contemporaneous with Huxley's Doors of Perception or even a couple of years earlier, and they were similarly emphasizing the um, common feature of changes to the sense of self under psychedelics. And these early publications are reviewed in this uh, review paper by Millier et al. And then you've got the fact that many senior Buddhist teachers of meditation, so today's senior Western teachers, began practicing meditation after having psychedelic experiences. This was part of what inspired them to take up the practice. And after decades of dedicated practice of traditional Buddhist meditation or Hindu meditation, 
some still maintain that their early uh, psychedelic experiences really did give them glimpses of the same territory that their meditation practices opened up in a more durable and stable way over the years. So basically, I think a closer look at the history of psychedelic research suggests that this these kinds of experiences, sort of ego dissolution changes to the sense of self and ego boundaries were being noted before anyone with a mystical agenda was kind of muddying the waters. The second point is that if we look more closely at reports of Buddhist meditators, we find a lot of evidence, I think, that people are having psychedelic type experiences to an extent that, uh, you know, again, can't plausibly be accounted for by kind of expectation and cultural transmission. So one really great source is this paper by Jack Cornfield from 1979. He interviewed people who were doing a three month intensive secluded Vipassana meditation retreat. And he has these categories of unusual experiences that people reported. And I've kind of cut down the original list again to try and save time. But some examples he gives, these are the kinds of things the meditators are reporting on their three-month retreat. Feeling one's body divided in half or one's torso expanding. Feeling one's body heavily pulled in all directions or feeling as though floating when one was really stone still. Experiencing one's body growing huge, then tiny, tiny. Seeing still objects moving, colours more intense. Hallucinations while walking. LSD melting like visions and camera like flashes of light, visions of Buddha and images of body cells and organs. And the practitioners also reported visual thoughts, dream like images, mental pictures, patterns of colors and visions, visions of Buddha or Christ, various religious imagery, visions of bodies and corpses and death, spontaneous visions of violence or of lustful scenes, and other vivid visual material, often reported as associated with strong emotional discharges. And I think reading that, that could be straight from LSD and psilocybin and ayahuasca trip reports on erowid.org. And it's just implausible to think that all of these meditators on these intensive retreats are having these experiences, these quintessentially psychedelic type experiences. I think it's important to note that a lot of these don't have anything to do with changes to the sense of self either. Like that's the point of commonality that is so often emphasized. But even in meditation, people are having a lot of the classic sort of perceptual type changes that are stereotypically associated with psychedelics and it's just implausible I think to hold that this is all due to all of these meditators having some associations in their minds between meditation and psychedelics and indeed if you look at ancient meditation manuals ancient Buddhist um, texts on the meditation path you will find all these types of experiences being documented and it's not at all plausible again to think that these ancient meditation manuals um, are, have all have significant psychedelic influence. So what does all this show? Well, I think it shows or suggests very strongly that there is a real connection between psychedelics and meditation, um, you know, classic psychedelic ingestion and mindfulness or insight meditation, that these two practices somehow affect overlapping psychological processes. The connection is deep. It's not merely superficial and it's not due solely to things like cultural transmission, priming and interpretive bias. So having established that, we are then entitled to ask, well, what exactly is the nature of the connection? And I'm not going to be able to address all of it, but in the next section of the talk, I'll look at, as I say, some of the recent quantitative evidence that gives us some clues before then going on to um, my hypothesis. So we're up to section two, recent evidence, and hopefully doing okay for time. Okay, so there are by now a bunch of studies that have probed the idea of a connection between psychedelics and meditation using rigorous quantitative empirical methods. This hasn't really happened until the last sort of 10 years or so, uh, but a lot of work has been done now. And the findings basically fall into three categories. So first, you've got studies showing increases in mindfulness capacities after psychedelic use. Second, you've got studies showing common neural correlates of psychedelic experiences and meditative states. And third, you've got studies showing synergistic effects of psychedelics and meditation. So um, protocols wherein psychedelic use seems to increase the beneficial effects of meditation practice and vice versa. So I'm going to take these um, in that order. So first off, the finding that by now seems fairly robust that psychedelic use can increase mindfulness related capacities. So various psychometric measures have been developed to quantify the effects of mindfulness training. So 
capacities for decentering, for kind of disidentifying with one's thoughts and feelings and viewing them as merely thoughts and feelings, as representations in the mind, capacities for non-judging, for kind of relating to one's uh, mental contents in a non-judgmental fashion, capacities for awareness, for actually being aware in real time of mental events as they unfold. These measures have been validated and they've been shown to be um, sensitive to meditation experience and to meditation training so it seems plausible that they really are measuring the kinds of capacities that people develop when they train in meditation and several studies have shown that a single psychedelic experience without any mindfulness training or any explicit reference to meditation or mindfulness can increase these so-called mindfulness related capacities in some cases for up to two or three months right so some of these studies only look at a day after a week after some of them go up to two or three months after and show significant increases in various mindfulness related capacities in psychedelic group versus the placebo group so that's one finding seems like even if there's no mindfulness training or explicit kind of mindfulness related agenda psychedelic use on its own can somehow promote um, at least temporarily some of these same sorts of attentional <coughs> pardon me attentional and psychological capacities second finding is that there seem to be overlapping neural correlates between meditation practice and psychedelic experiences now neuroimaging of both of these practices is notoriously challenging for a bunch of reasons right both practices are very very heterogeneous they can cause lots of different effects in different people lots of individual difference and difference in methods and so on but if you sort of zoom out a bit and look at a fairly abstract coarse grained level there are two large scale brain networks that have been discussed a lot in cognitive neuroscience in the last 15 or so years the most famous of course is the default mode network which gets talked about a lot in the psychedelic and meditation literature and this has been linked to things like introspection mind wandering mental time travel so the simulation of past and future events especially autobiographical events theory of mind so attributing mental states to oneself and others and a sort of narrative or autobiographical sense of self and then you've got the salience network which is involved in um, or linked to things like interoception and emotion so sensing the internal condition of the body emotional feelings the attribution of meaning or relevance or importance to stimuli and to a more minimal or so-called embodied sense of self and basically as i say if we zoom out and abstract from a lot of the variation a lot of the noise we find that across a whole bunch of studies both of these networks are reliably modulated by psychedelics and meditation so psychedelic ingestion mindfulness meditation practice both reliably cause changes of some kind or other to the default mode network and the salience network to the activity and connectivity of these networks and in many cases these changes to these networks seem to correlate with changes to the sense of self measured um, psychometrically so that's a second finding is that both practices seem to reliably modulate these two large-scale brain networks that are both linked to various aspects of self-representation or the sense of self. <clears throat> okay, so third and final finding is um, synergistic effect. So it seems like psychedelic ingestion and meditation practice can interact synergistically. Meditation can enhance the beneficial effects of psychedelic administration and vice versa. So, so far, as far as I know, there are basically two studies showing this. So you've got study by Griffiths et al from a few years ago showing basically this is simplifying, but in two high dose psilocybin groups, so two groups of healthy volunteers that are given high doses of psilocybin, one group is given high, high levels of support to engage in daily meditation before and after their psilocybin experience. The other group is given a lower level of support to engage in meditation practice. And the group that's given higher support to engage in meditation practice shows greater intensity of mystical type experiences on psilocybin and greater sort of lasting psychological benefits, increases in well-being and so on from those mystical type experiences. And then you've got this incredible more recent study by Smigielski at all. So experienced Zen meditators on a five-day group retreat. And on day four, uh, they receive psilocybin or placebo in a double-blind fashion. Um, and the ones who receive psilocybin, of course, have these deep experiences of ego dissolution, oceanic boundlessness. And the ones who receive the psilocybin as opposed to the placebo show greater long-lasting benefits 
benefits, including greater increases in mindfulness capacity and um, changes to network brain network connectivity while they're meditating in the days and weeks after the retreat. So that's the third and final finding is that these two practices seem to enhance each other's uh, beneficial, lasting beneficial psychological effects. So the question then is, what should we make of all this, right? What does all this show about the nature of the connection between classic psychedelic ingestion and mindfulness meditation? That brings us to the third and final section of the talk. So what is the nature of the connection? So my hypothesis can be stated fairly simply and it's indebted to this recent paper that came out just last year by Hanley et al. Uh, the paper is called Mindfulness Training Encourages Self-Transcendent States by Decentering. And my hypothesis is that psychedelics do the reverse, right? They promote decentering by inducing self-transcendent states. So it's kind of like both methods are doing the same thing, but from opposite directions, meeting in the middle. So let's unpack this a bit. So what is decentering? As I said earlier, it's one of the skills that mindfulness training promotes, and it's basically the skill of disidentifying with one's thoughts and feelings, getting a bit of distance or separation from them, and seeing them as mere thoughts and feelings, recognizing them as representations in the mind rather than just automatically and unquestioningly taking them for reality itself. And so there is this interesting phenomenon that is well documented by meditation practitioners and others that in the instant that you actually notice, you explicitly notice yourself having thoughts like, I'm hopeless or I'm unworthy or I'm unlovable or whatever, precisely in that moment, you gain some freedom from that thought because by explicitly noticing it, you recognize it as a thought and that allows you to see that it's a representation of the world, right? So you go from just unthinkingly accepting it as your, the lens through which you see the world to suddenly seeing it as one more object in consciousness, just an appearance among other appearances and you see it as just a thought in your head, something that could be right, could be wrong. You stop kind of taking it for reality itself. And so this experience, right, of recognizing your mental representations of the world as representations in philosophy of mind goes by the name phenomenal opacity as opposed to transparency. So the prime example would be lucid dreaming, right? So if you suddenly start lucid dreaming, you suddenly realize that what you had previously been taking for an objective external mind independent world is all just a simulation a kind of virtual reality construction of your brain but the thought is that it's this this same kind of experience that you have in mindfulness practice in relation to your own thoughts and emotions and so on you suddenly snap out of them as it were and see them as representations rather than sort of naively as reality itself now what Hanley et al did is they studied um people, I think healthy volunteers who were doing an eight or 10 week course of meditation training. And they measured throughout the uh, the course, you know, how much people's decentering abilities were increasing, how good they were getting at this decentering skill. And they also looked at the extent to which people were having self transcendent experiences. So experiences of the dissolution of bodily boundaries, dissolution of ego boundaries, and so on. And basically, they found that Decentering increases in decentering ability by the midpoint of the course strongly predicted increases in self transcendent experience by the end of the course. So, the people who were getting better by the middle of the training at kind of decentering from their own thoughts and feelings are the ones who tended to be having more and more intense self transcendent experiences by the end of it. So, this suggests that this might be a key part of how mindfulness meditation leads to these self-transcendent experiences, experiences of ego dissolution or boundary dissolution or whatever, is by cultivating this skill of decentering. So the ability to actually disidentify with all the thoughts and feelings that we normally experience as parts of ourselves and uh, cultivating the ability instead to just see them as not something personal, but just uh, representations, appearances in consciousness that might or might not be true. So my suggestion is basically that psychedelics do the same thing, but from the other direction. So it's this idea where mindfulness meditation ultimately causes one's self-model or self-representation sense of self to collapse by gradually chipping away at it, by cultivating this ability to shift and weaken the boundaries of the sense of self by kind of taking things outside of the me and world boundary. The thought is psychedelics go straight for the jugular, if you like. They go right in and directly disrupt the neural substrates of the self-model, and that leads directly to these experiences of dissolution of self, dissolution of ego boundaries, and that's what gives you then 
under the influence acutely during the experience and then also after the experience, this phenomenon of decentering, this ability to get some distance from thoughts and feelings. It's because that boundary has been redrawn. It's become weaker, more, more sort of ambiguous, permeable, por porous. And so then you get this um, ability more readily and more, uh, more easily to kind of uh, put thoughts and feelings outside the self and world boundary, if you like. So, yeah, that's basically what I've just said. When psychedelics disrupt the neural substrates of self-modeling, the default mode and salience networks, they stop us identifying with all the things that we usually identify with that we normally experience as us, including stories, narratives, thoughts, feelings, and perspectives. And all these mental contents don't necessarily go away, but they're no longer experienced as me. As I say, they can be experienced as being on the outside of the self and other boundary. And so that allows them to be viewed with a bit more distance, spaciousness, detachment, uh, objectivity, and humor. So that's basically the story, according to me. Um, psychedelics and meditation can both induce self-transcendent states involving decentering and phenomenal opacity, the recognition of mental representations as representations, but the causal mechanisms and the psychological directions um, are different. They sort of come to the same point from opposite directions. And so my parting thought is that if this is right, then it suggests that we can really advance our understanding of both of these practices by doing detailed systematic comparisons and contrasts. And so one comparison and contrast that I'm particularly interested in has to do with their epistemic status, right? So it's another commonality between these practices that um, people typically attribute various forms of insight or knowledge gain to them. And in a lot of my work, I've been interested in um, evaluating claims to gain knowledge from psychedelic states. And my thought is that if we want to undertake a similar project in relation to meditation and sort of evaluate whether this is a, a, the sort of practice that really can give us genuine, reliable knowledge of the world or trustworthy insights, then maybe one way to approach that would be via a systematic comparison and contrast of these two um, seemingly dissimilar, but on closer inspection, actually interestingly and closely related practices. So that's it. And um, I hope this has all been actually coming through. Okay, thanks. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. Dr. Lethby, we're coming through for you. Yep. Wonderful. Okay. So I believe we have time for a few questions. Uh, let's first see in here in the room, and then we'll check in with the online audience. What about the connection between meditation and uh, um, uh, experiences with psychedelics? Do you um, can use it in psychedelic uh, for psychedelics uh, sessions? Okay. Yeah, yeah, good. So, as in, is is meditation useful for uh, promoting the beneficial effects of psychedelics and avoiding their risks and so on well yeah the evidence suggests so and i mean uh, in some studies you know part of the preparatory therapy comes from things like third wave behavioral therapies like acceptance and commitment therapy and so on which fundamentally include mindfulness type skills anyway uh, but one of those studies also speaks directly to this so the smigielski at all study where the experienced Zen meditators had psilocybin on day four of their retreat. Basically, they used the 5D ASD scale and they saw unusually low levels of anxiety. So the meditators had less anxiety on a high dose of psilocybin than is typical. So that speaks very strongly to this kind of, again, this kind of 
uh, clinical wisdom, this, this wisdom that is out there, you know, but hasn't been tested much scientifically, this provides a bit of quantitative evidence that yes, that really is the case. Being a, an experienced meditator, having mindfulness type skills does protect you to some extent from um, the dysphoric or the um, anxiogenic effects of psychedelics. So, yeah. Okay, great. And then I think we have a question from the online audience. Do you want to ask Hannah? Okay. Yeah, so we have a question from David online asking, what are your thoughts on a secular spirituality? Is it possible at all? Yes, I think it is. I mean, I have a paper. My, my angle on this question has been more about um, naturalism and spirituality, right? Can we have um, something that is genuinely worth calling spirituality but doesn't require non-naturalistic beliefs? And I think we absolutely can. I think evidence from both psychedelic science and meditation science speaks very directly to that question because if you look at uh, the sorts of experiences that psychedelics induce that people tend to call spiritual, right? You find that in several studies they ask people, you know, how spiritually significant was this experience? Was it in the sort of top five most spiritually significant experiences of your life and this kind of thing? And their tendency to rate it as spiritually significant correlates with the construct of a mystical type experience. So that suggests if we look at this construct of a mystical type experience, that can give us some clues about what spirituality really is or what it means to these trial participants. And I think when you look closely, you find that actually the way the mystical type experience is operationalized a lot of experiences that fall into the basket actually are totally naturalistic and secular. So they don't involve cosmic consciousness or a spirit world, but instead they involve this highly meaningful experiences of ego dissolution, changes to the sense of self, profound existential insights, but nothing that is intrinsically either tied to institutional religion or tied to non-naturalistic metaphysics. So I think, yes, something, if you, you know, a naturalistic spirituality, at least, I have argued is possible and that psychedelic evidence helps to show that it is possible and what it might look like. Okay, great. I think we need to go on to the next speaker. Let's thank Dr. Lethaby. Uh, being linked to things like introspection, mind wandering, mental time travel, so the simulation of past and future events, especially autobiographical events, theory of mind, so attributing mental states to oneself and others, and a sort of narrative or autobiographical sense of self. And then you've got the salience network, which is involved in um, or linked to things like interoception and emotion, so sensing the internal condition of the body, emotional feelings, the attribution of meaning or relevance or importance to stimuli, and to a more minimal or so-called embodied sense of self. And basically, as I say, if we zoom out and abstract from a lot of the variation, a lot of the noise, we find that across a whole bunch of studies, both of these networks are reliably modulated by psychedelics and meditation. So psychedelic ingestion, mindfulness meditation practice, both reliably cause changes of some kind or other to the default mode network and the salience network, to the activity and connectivity of these networks. And in many cases, these changes to these networks seem to correlate with changes to the sense of self measured um, psychometrically. So that's a second finding, is that both practices seem to reliably modulate these two large-scale brain networks that are both linked to various aspects of self-representation or the sense of self. <clears throat> okay, so third and final finding is um, synergistic effect. So it seems like psychedelic ingestion and meditation practice can interact synergistically. Meditation can enhance the beneficial effects of psychedelic administration and vice versa. So, so far, as far as I know, there are basically two studies showing this. So you've got study by Griffiths et al. from a few years ago showing basically, this is simplifying, but in two 
high dose psilocybin groups. So two groups of healthy volunteers that are given high doses of psilocybin. One group is given high, high levels of support to engage in daily meditation before and after their psilocybin experience. The other group is given a lower level of support to engage in meditation practice. And the group that's given higher support to engage in meditation practice shows greater intensity of mystical type experiences on psilocybin and greater sort of lasting psychological benefits, increases in well-being and so on from those mystical type experiences. And then you've got this incredible more recent study by Smigielski at also experienced Zen meditators on a five-day group retreat. And on day four, uh, they receive psilocybin or placebo in a double blind fashion. Um, and the ones who receive psilocybin, of course, have these deep experiences of ego dissolution, oceanic boundlessness, and the ones who receive the psilocybin as opposed to the placebo show greater long-lasting benefits, including greater increases in mindfulness capacity and um, changes to network brain network connectivity while they're meditating in the days and weeks after the retreat. So that's the third and final finding is that these two practices seem to enhance each other's uh, beneficial, lasting beneficial psychological effects. So the question then is, what should we make of all this, right? What does all this show about the nature of the connection between classic psychedelic ingestion and mindfulness meditation? That brings us to the third and final section of the talk. So what is the nature of the connection? So my hypothesis can be stated fairly simply and it's indebted to this recent paper that came out just last year by Hanley et al. Uh, the paper is called Mindfulness Training Encourages Self-Transcendent States by Decentering. And my hypothesis is that psychedelics do the reverse, right? They promote decentering by inducing self-transcendent states. So it's kind of like both methods are doing the same thing, but from opposite directions, meeting in the middle. So let's unpack this a bit. So what is decentering? As I said earlier, it's one of the skills that mindfulness training promotes, and it's basically the skill of disidentifying with one's thoughts and feelings, getting a bit of distance or separation from them, and seeing them as mere thoughts and feelings, recognizing them as representations in the mind rather than just automatically and unquestioningly taking them for reality itself. And so there is this interesting phenomenon that is well documented by meditation practitioners and others that in the instant that you actually notice, you explicitly notice yourself having thoughts like, I'm hopeless or I'm unworthy or I'm unlovable or whatever, precisely in that moment, you gain some freedom from that thought because by explicitly noticing it, you recognize it as a thought and that allows you to see that it's a representation of the world, right? So you go from just unthinkingly accepting it as your, the lens through which you see the world to suddenly seeing it as one more object in consciousness, just an appearance among other appearances and you see it as just a thought in your head, something that could be right, could be wrong. You stop kind of taking it for reality itself. And so this experience, right, of recognizing your mental representations of the world as representations in philosophy of mind goes by the name phenomenal opacity as opposed to transparency. So the prime example would be lucid dreaming, right? So if you suddenly start lucid dreaming, you suddenly realize that what you had previously been taking for an objective external mind independent world is all just a simulation a kind of virtual reality construction of your brain but the thought is that it's this this same kind of experience that you have in mindfulness practice in relation to your own thoughts and emotions and so on you suddenly snap out of them as it were and see them as representations rather than sort of naively as reality itself now what Hanley et al did is they studied um people, I think healthy volunteers who were doing an eight or 10 week course of meditation training. And they measured throughout the uh, the course, you know, how much people's decentering abilities were increasing, how good they were getting at this decentering skill. And they also looked at the extent to which people were having self transcendent experiences. So experiences of the dissolution of bodily boundaries, dissolution of ego boundaries, and so on. And basically, they found that Decentering increases in decentering ability by the midpoint of the course strongly predicted increases in self transcendent experience by the end of the course. So, the people who were getting better by the middle of the training at kind of decentering from their own thoughts and feelings are the ones who tended to be having more and more intense self transcendent experiences by the end of it. So, this suggests that this might be a key part of how mindfulness meditation leads to these self-transcendent experiences, experiences of ego dissolution or boundary dissolution or whatever, is by cultivating this skill of decentering. So the ability to actually 
disidentify with all the thoughts and feelings that we normally experience as parts of ourselves and uh, cultivating the ability instead to just see them as not something personal but just uh, representations, appearances in consciousness that might or might not be true. So my suggestion is basically that psychedelics do the same thing but from the other direction. So it's this idea where mindfulness meditation ultimately causes one's self-model or self-representation sense of self to collapse by gradually chipping away at it, by cultivating this ability to shift and weaken the boundaries of the sense of self by kind of taking things outside of the me and world boundary. The thought is psychedelics go straight for the jugular, if you like. They go right in and directly disrupt the neural substrates of the self-model, and that leads directly to these experiences of dissolution of self, dissolution of ego boundaries, and that's what gives you then under the influence acutely during the experience and then also after the experience, this phenomenon of decentering, this ability to get some distance from thoughts and feelings. It's because that boundary has been redrawn. It's become weaker, more, more sort of ambiguous, permeable, por porous. And so then you get this um, ability more readily and more, uh, more easily to kind of uh, put thoughts and feelings outside the self and world boundary, if you like. So, yeah, that's basically what I've just said. When psychedelics disrupt the neural substrates of self-modeling, the default mode and salience networks, they stop us identifying with all the things that we usually identify with that we normally experience as us, including stories, narratives, thoughts, feelings, and perspectives. And all these mental contents don't necessarily go away, but they're no longer experienced as me. As I say, they can be experienced as being on the outside of the self and other boundary. And so that allows them to be viewed with a bit more distance, spaciousness, detachment, uh, objectivity, and humor. So that's basically the story, according to me. Um, psychedelics and meditation can both induce self-transcendent states involving decentering and phenomenal opacity, the recognition of mental representations as representations, but the causal mechanisms and the psychological directions um, are different. They sort of come to the same point from opposite directions. And so my parting thought is that if this is right, then it suggests that we can really advance our understanding of both of these practices by doing detailed systematic comparisons and contrasts. And so one comparison and contrast that I'm particularly interested in has to do with their epistemic status, right? So it's another commonality between these practices that um, people typically attribute various forms of insight or knowledge gain to them. And in a lot of my work, I've been interested in um, evaluating claims to gain knowledge from psychedelic states. And my thought is that if we want to undertake a similar project in relation to meditation and sort of evaluate whether this is a, a, the sort of practice that really can give us genuine, reliable knowledge of the world or trustworthy insights, then maybe one way to approach that would be via a systematic comparison and contrast of these two um, seemingly dissimilar but on closer inspection actually interestingly and closely related practices so that's it and um, I hope this has all been actually coming through okay thanks I'm going to stop sharing my screen now Dr. Lethby, we're coming through for you. Yep. Wonderful. Okay. So I believe we have time for a few questions. Uh, let's first see in here in the room, and then we'll check in with the online audience. What about the connection between meditation and uh, um, uh, experiences with psychedelics? Do you um, can use it in psychedelic uh, for psychedelics uh, sessions 
Yeah, yeah, good. So as in, is, is meditation useful for uh, promoting the beneficial effects of psychedelics and avoiding their risks and so on? Well, yeah, the evidence suggests so. And I mean, uh, in some studies, you know, part of the preparatory therapy comes from things like third wave behavioral therapies like acceptance and commitment therapy and so on which fundamentally include mindfulness type skills anyway uh, but one of those studies also speaks directly to this so the smigielski at all study where the experienced zen meditators had psilocybin on day four of their retreat basically they used the 5d asd scale and they saw unusually low levels of anxiety so the meditators had less anxiety on a high dose of psilocybin than is typical so that speaks very strongly to this kind of, again this kind of uh, clinical wisdom this, this wisdom that is out there you know but hasn't been tested much scientifically this provides a bit of quantitative evidence that yes that really is the case being a, an experienced meditator having mindfulness type skills does protect you to some extent from uh, the dysphoric or the um, anxiogenic effects of psychedelics so yeah okay great and then i think we have a question from the online audience do you want to ask hannah okay yeah, so we have a question from David online asking, what are your thoughts on a secular spirituality? Is it possible at all? Yes, I think it is. I mean, I have a paper. My, my angle on this question has been more about um, naturalism and spirituality, right? Can we have um, something that is genuinely worth calling spirituality but doesn't require non-naturalistic beliefs? And I think we absolutely can. I think evidence from both psychedelic science and meditation science speaks very directly to that question because if you look at uh, the sorts of experiences that psychedelics induce that people tend to call spiritual right you find that in several studies they ask people you know how spiritually significant was this experience was it in the sort of top five most spiritually significant experiences of your life and this kind of thing and their tendency to rate it as spiritually significant correlates with the construct of a mystical type experience so that suggests if we look at this construct of a mystical type experience that can give us some clues about what spirituality really is or what it means to these trial participants and i think when you look closely you find that actually the way the mystical type experience is operationalized a lot of experiences that fall into the basket actually are totally naturalistic and secular. So they don't involve cosmic consciousness or a spirit world, but instead they involve this highly meaningful experiences of ego dissolution, changes to the sense of self, profound existential insights, but nothing that is intrinsically either tied to institutional religion or tied to non-naturalistic metaphysics. So I think, yes, something, if you, you know, a naturalistic spirituality, at least, I have argued is possible and that psychedelic evidence helps to show that it is possible and what it might look like. Okay, great. I think we need to go on to the next speaker. Let's thank Dr. Lethaby. Hello, Chris. Can you hear me? Yeah, hi. Right. Uh, yeah, so, so welcome to, to the speaker corner. Now we would uh, do a bit more Q&A. Um, if anyone has any questions, you can already uh, put it in the Q&A section and we will, uh, we will uh, answer, uh, well, Chris will answer your questions because I'm not qualified enough. Um, oh, and, gosh. <laughs> yeah. Hope someday I will be. Um, and uh, before uh, before people think about oh, um, so there's there's a question from uh, from David again, um, and the question is this: You showed evidence of heightened mindfulness from psychedelics on some slide. Could you show this again? Yeah, I can. I can share my screen and show you. It's not full references though. It's just a bunch of um, authors and years. Um, I can always send you the full references if you send me an email, but I'll bring it up. Hang on. Um, how do I share? Oh, it says I can't share my screen while the question is shown on stage. Um, okay, then I'll mark that, the uh, yeah, unless you, I don't know if you wanted to ask something specific about it, but if you just want the references, um, just please send me an email and I can send you the whole reference list for the talk. All right, then let's move on to other questions. 
Um, there is a question from Clara, and she's asking, do you think psychedelic induced decentering may be more short term and or unstable since it has be, uh, hasn't been brought about by intentional practice? Yeah, although, you know, I think you, you might, I get the point, but you also might want to describe psychedelic experience, psychedelic use in some cases and in some sense as intentional practice. And I think a lot of people do go into it with this mindset of, you know, I'm going to learn skills and learn things about how to relate to my mind. But I still think, yeah, it probably is um, at least more short term, right? I think the longest that these increases have been documented today is three months. Um, I mean, it's interesting that in some therapeutic studies, decreases in depression and anxiety have been shown to persist for up to four years in some cases, but I would be very surprised if significant in increases in decentering or whatever lasted for that long, yeah. I suspect it's more like, it's more um, of like an afterglow type phenomenon, you know, and then maybe it sort of decreases and stays above, somewhat above baseline, but I would yeah, be surprised if it stays highly above baseline in the really long term. Though, you know, it would be interesting to look at people who use psychedelics regularly. So there's one study showing that members of ayahuasca churches who have been doing it for um, five years on average have higher levels of a construct called self-transcendence than um, matched controls and so I wouldn't be surprised if you looked at people like that and found that their mindfulness capacities were above average but that's a completely different case of course they're doing it once a week or once a fortnight or whatever. All right uh, thanks a lot for that answer. Uh, moving on, um, Ivana uh, wants to know, uh, can you say something about meditation ef um, effect on the DMN? Uh, there was a talk here about meditation increasing the default mode network, uh, which then would mean the self becoming stronger from the practice. And that's the, the opposite from what we're, uh, what, what we've been talking about here. Yeah, yeah. So I was in that talk too, and I, I noticed that two or three times. I'm trying to remember the speaker's name, and I can't. But every time that was said, that kind of set off my my light bulb as well, because that sounded like the opposite of what I've typically heard. Um, so I was a bit unsure about that. Um, as far as I know, the usual effect of meditation is to downregulate the DMN. On the other hand, right, in at least one of these studies, there was a really interesting finding. So that, that Smigielski et al. study where the Zen meditators have psilocybin on day four of their retreat. So what they saw after that, uh, I'm pretty sure, I'm 90% sure of this, was that default mode network integrity and connectivity was higher in the resting state um, in the psilocybin group. But then when um, the practitioners went into open awareness meditation, the psilocybin group showed a greater ability to disintegrate, to downregulate the default mode network. And that actually, um, the, the researchers related that to earlier findings. So Carhart Harris et al. had a study of psilocybin for treatment resistant depression, where they were surprised to find that um, default mode network integrity was increased after the treatment and that this seemed to correlate with antidepressant effects and so their explanation was well it's not it's too simplistic to just think that like even though there are all these correlations right you do see like high levels of DMN activity and connectivity and depression. They said, well, it's just too simplistic to think that more DMN is bad and less DMN is good. It's about patterns of connectivity. And they this kind of jives well with a perspective according to which, you know, the default mode network, among other things, is harboring a self-representation or a self-model. And the benefit, the point of disintegrating it is to uh, disintegrate that self-model so that then you can rewrite that story of self, that narrative. And then afterwards, what happens is you might actually have in some sense a more robust a more strong sense of self but it's also more flexible and that kind of fits with the apparent changes in neural dynamics of these meditators that you know it, it's extrapolating of course but it's very tempting to say well what it means that they've got higher DMN integrity in the rest state and that they're more able to disintegrate the DMN in open awareness meditation is that from this retreat, this psilocybin assisted retreat and this mystical experience, they've simultaneously got a stronger and more robust, more integrated, but also a more flexible sense of self that they can kind of switch off in meditation. Um. All right, thanks, uh, thanks a lot for the answer and the interesting discussion. Um, I think we have time uh, for a few more questions. Um, um, the next one is from Kavya. And um, 
she is asking, do you think the practice of meditation could reverse the detrimental effects of psychedelic use due to uh, use without any guidance or due to abuse? Interesting question. I mean, I'm inclined to say maybe, but this is pure speculation. I don't know of any evidence relevant to this um, and... I can't think of any any evidence or any anything in this theoretical perspective that would even warrant this extrapolation. So, yeah, it's a bit of a boring answer, but basically sounds kind of plausible to me. But I don't have any any deeper thoughts about it than that, really. Yeah, um, I mean, you know, okay. So one thing is, and again, this is pretty speculative, but like if someone had a history of problematic psychedelic use, or if they had had sort of dysphoric or really seriously bad trips or even psychedelic induced psychosis or whatever they might not want to go too deep into meditation because precisely with this sort of overlap of psychological and experiential effects that might trigger um, flashbacks or something like that so my thought would be that if this is right then perhaps it would have to be a sort of relatively shallow sort of meditation you know not not in the first instance at least going into really deep self-transcendent states but fairly light kind of steady stuff but again this is all very speculative yeah right um and there's actually another uh question from kavya um is there any way that the content of the original talk, which included the introduction to meditation and psychedelics, be shared? Uh, could you explain uh, phenomenal opacity and epistemic status? Yeah, sure. So um, the chapter that this is based on is available um, freely online, a preprint version on my website. Um, I'm happy to email that or the slides to anyone who wants to drop me a line. But basically, phenomenal opacity is just this idea. So the original concept in philosophy of mind is actually phenomenal transparency. And I should note that like a lot of philosophical concepts, it gets defined in many different ways. I'm using it in a very specific way that is uh, uh, common to, well, it's in a lot of Thomas Metzinger's work. And so the idea is that our conscious experiences of the world, right, our experiences of ourselves, our bodies, things outside of us, like other people and um, trees, tables, chairs, whatever, that these are, are in fact mental representations, right? But it seems to us as though we are sort of immediately and directly in contact with the world around us, but really we're not. Really this contact is kind of mediated through some sort of internal model or simulation, some sort of virtual reality type, uh, you know, created by our brain. And the notion of transparency basically refers to the idea that normally we don't experience our mental representations of the world as representations right it's as though we just look through them so it's like if you're looking through a really clean piece of glass you don't notice the glass right you just look straight through it and see the things outside um, and that's an imperfect analogy but the idea is it, it's like that right our attention as we're kind of experiencing the world via our mental representations, our conscious phenomenal representations of the world, our attention is not usually drawn to the representations themselves. We just feel as though we're directly in touch with the real tables, chairs, people, whatever themselves. And the thought is under some circumstances that can be disrupted, right? Our attention can be drawn to the fact that these, you know, what I am experiencing, the way I'm putting this is very contentious in philosophy and any, any philosophers who are listening, I apologize for the way I'm kind of blurring a lot of important distinctions, but this is the basic idea is that, you know, sometimes our attention gets drawn to the fact that what we are encountering in experience is not the things in themselves, but is actually some kind of internal uh, representation or simulation. And that's what phenomenal opacity means. It's that experience when you suddenly realize that, oh, this perception or this thought or this feeling is a mental event, right? It's not the world itself, but it's actually an inner representation of the world. And so, as I say, the classic example of that is lucid dreaming. You're in a lucid dream and you're maybe walking across clouds and, you know, there's some unicorns floating past you and you're just, at first, you're non-lucid and you're just taking it all for, for granted that this is the world, you know, I'm in the world. And then suddenly you realise something triggers you, you go, I'm dreaming. And in that instant, you realise that, that's not a unicorn, that's not a cloud, that's not my body. These are all representations. This is all some kind of story my brain is creating, some kind of model or fiction or whatever. And of course, you know, 
there is an assumption in the ordinary sober waking state that those models, the content of those models is being influenced, is being constrained by real input from a real external world. And so this is why people like Anil Seth talk about perception, conscious perception as being a controlled hallucination, because the idea is it's the same mechanism as a hallucination. It's the same kind of internally generated sort of world model or virtual reality, but a bit in the ordinary sober waking state, the contents of the virtual reality are being strongly controlled or constrained by actual input coming in through the senses from the real external world. But so, that's the idea of phenomenal opacity. And the thought is that it doesn't just apply to perceptual representations, like realizing that, hey, you know, this isn't the real tree, this is my conscious mental representation of the tree, but it can also apply to thoughts and feelings, right? Suddenly when you have that decentering experience of snapping out of the thought and getting some distance from it, you suddenly realize that it is a representation. It's just a thought, it's not actually reality itself. So that was a really long mini lecture on phenomenal opacity. I hope if it made it uh, kind of clear. Epistemic status is easier. So epistemic just means knowledge related. So when I talk about the epistemic status of the psychedelic experience, I mean it's, its status with respect to our knowledge of the world or our ability to gain knowledge of the world. So does the psychedelic experience overall improve or, or kind of harm? Does it increase or decrease our ability to gain real knowledge about what the world is like? So yeah, that's what those things are. Um, okay, thanks a lot, Chris, for this. Um, I personally find this uh, topic of uh, lucid dreaming uh, and uh, phenomenal opacity, which is also a term that I didn't know before, very interesting, and also the connection between the two, which honestly I haven't seen before. But um, thinking back to my own lucid dreams, it did have some kind of effect like that, whereas I was uh, able to have more, uh, more distance towards my uh, own representation uh, in real life uh, than before. Mm, interesting. Yeah, yeah. So the opacity persisted a bit beyond the lucid dream. Exactly, exactly. Uh, yeah, cool. uh, yeah I, I wonder if uh, if that could be harnessed uh, in a, a therapeutic way. Um, so, yeah, so I mean, that raises the, the other interesting question of, you know, so there's a question earlier about can mindfulness practice help with psychedelics? So there's a question about could lucid dreaming help as a preparation for psychedelic experience too? Um, yes, yes. Yeah, precisely. Uh, of course, it's way uh, harder to to uh, summon a, a lucid dream and that usually happens spontaneously um, or with long uh, practice. Although, of course, there are meditative practices specifically designed to induce lucid dreams. So in, you know, the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, you've got dream yoga and this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. Mm. Um, all right. So if um, there are no more questions from the audience, uh, thanks a lot, uh, Chris, for, for uh, your presentation and for the uh, discussion. Uh, and um enjoy the the rest of the conference and uh, see you around in the in the foyer uh, uh, actually i wish you were here too <laughs> i wish i were because yeah. yeah thank you so much thanks all everyone right. for the questions thanks all right have a nice day goodbye bye